called you. He said in a timeline. He's given him a frame of reference. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now just hang with me just a minute. Now to me and you, or you and I to be more correct, Philip, Andrew, Simon Peter, John, and everybody else alive, that means absolutely nothing. The Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't talk about it. The Bible doesn't elaborate on it. The Bible doesn't give us any hints. The Bible doesn't give us any ideas. Uh, the Bible, do Jesus doesn't tell. It's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like him drawing in the sand. The Bible does not say what he drew in the sand, but people have preached a, a big, long, uh, powerful, flowery messages on what Jesus wrote in the dirt. We don't know what Jesus wrote in the dirt. And we do not know what Nathaniel was doing under the fig tree. But the fact that Jesus uses this... Nathaniel says, How do you know me? And the way the Lord says, This is how I know you. Is before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now to us, that means nothing. I don't know what he was doing under the fig tree. Maybe he was sleeping under the fig tree. You know, it doesn't mean anything to me. But somehow it ministered Nathaniel in a powerful and a unique way because immediately he says, You're the rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the Messiah. Now, I, some of it is some of it is lost on us because we've got a confrontation between Jesus Christ and Nathaniel, and the, and Nathaniel says, he said, "Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. He knows personal things about him." And Nathaniel says, uh, "From where do you know me?" And he said, "Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you." So what happened under the fig tree? What happened under the fig tree? Nobody knows. The scripture doesn't tell us. And it's not important to us, at least as far as those details go. And what's more, we talked a little bit about this Friday night in our leadership planning session. Don't get caught up in the details. The details of what went on between Nathaniel and the fig tree and the Lord don't matter nothing to us. It's none of our business. <laughs> okay. The details are not important. But what is, however, important to us is that number one, God is no respecter of persons. He hath made of one blood every nation to dwell on the face of the earth. And number two, He's aware. He told the disciples, he told the people, you're worrying about what you're going to eat, you're worrying about what you're going to drink. Let me tell you something. I know how many hairs there are on your head. There ain't but one they, little Tweety Bird falls out of the nest that I don't know it. Consider the lilies of the field. There's not a king with more splendor than them. Yet they're no good for nothing but to be pretty. He is aware. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Where is that place? Where is that place? Where you were alone. Maybe not a physical place altogether, but an emotional place. A spiritual place. When you were able to cry out to God. When you were completely honest and transparent before Him. When you said, I ain't sure about that Pentecost church. When you said, I would really, really, really like to experience what they have. I want to know if it's real. You see, it was there. It wasn't walking with Philip. It wasn't, you know, conversing with Philip. It wasn't, you know, going to the grocery store in Cana of Galilee. But it was in the, uh, the, the occurrence under the fig tree. That Nathaniel's lack of guile was manifest. It was under the fig tree where his true, where he was.
was truly introduced to the Lord. Nathaniel is coming. Please hear me right now. Nathaniel is coming. And in his mind, he ain't never met Jesus. But he doesn't know they've already been introduced. They've already been introduced. Where is that place? Where you were able to just be the real you. A place where you thought you were alone. Where the deepest desires of your heart were manifest. Where your real concerns were spoken. You know, very rarely, very rarely, once in a blue moon, are we worried about food. Or are we worried about a way to go or a place to go. Most of the time, we're just worried how fast can we get there. But where your real concerns were spoken. A place where you could be who you really are when you're by yourself. A place where it's safe. A place where I won't be judged. A place where there is no pressure. Please stay with me. A place where there is no pressure to perform. A place where I can cry. Where I can weep. Where I can agonize. Where I can dump out my heart. Where I can share these crazy thoughts that go in my mind. That if anybody on earth ever heard them, they would think I was an idiot. Where I would be judged. Where I would be labeled. Where then from now on when they talked about me, they would say, there ain't nothing good in him. I know what he's thinking. The importance of this is that while you were in this place... While you were under a fig tree, so to speak, it was there that God saw you. Not the you that you want everybody to see. Not the you, the image of you that you have created. See, one of the reasons why people are so afraid of what Pentecost is, is the influence of the Holy Ghost. Makes me take down the mask and take off the facade and let me be who I really am. That's why it's so beautiful. That's why somebody that comes in that doesn't know the rules and doesn't know the ritual and doesn't know how you're supposed to act and when you're supposed to clap and when you're supposed to raise your hands, but they throw them up in the air and they clap vociferously and they run around, they holler, yell, and they spit. Because I'm finally in a place. I'm finally in a place. Our world, God have mercy, do you not see it? Our world promotes such an ideology of who you need to be. And God's only interested in who you really are. And it's under the fig tree that God saw you. And you just thought you were alone in that place. And it is the person under the fig tree that He desires to minister to. What he said to Nathaniel ministered to him. And it all boiled down to what went on in the fig tree. While you're coming toward him, don't be amazed when he speaks into your life. Not the life that you want everybody to see. But who you were when you were under the fig tree. The most powerful concept surrounding this revelation is that not only does God desire to be able to deal with us as we truly are, but He desires us to see Him as He truly is. The world has painted a picture of God that is so far from who He really is. He is a God that commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Well, we like to say that. But while we were yet sinners. You know what that means, Joel? That means we can go to the place we were at our lowest. I can go to the place I was at my worst. I can go to the place where I don't want nobody on this earth to know who I was. And that's when he died for me. He didn't die for the me that I try to present. He died for the me that when I lay in my bed at night and wet the, wet the pillow with my tears. Because
because that's who He is. He was God of all creation. He, he commanded the sun to hang where it is and the moon to where it is and the stars where they go. He, he commanded everything that exists, everything that happens. The reason why the lion devours the zebra is because God made him that way. He's the I Am. That's why John's prologue of creation segues directly into his introduction to his disciples. It is the principle of creation that he desires. is to bring you back to who you really are. Creation was done as he desired. It's the same principle he desires for his prized creation. You and I to be made into his image. And we cannot do that without a fig tree experience. We cannot do that until we have went to a place where I thought I was by myself. And the real me came out. So yeah, you've preached along these lines a lot lately. I have, and I'm going to keep on doing it. Because we fall so in love with an image. There's some things happened over the last couple of weeks that my first reaction was one of anger. That's ridiculous. And then my second reaction was one of compassion because it was so ridiculous. But it's the world system. It's the world way of doing things. There's so much relief. I, I talked to somebody, a, a friend of mine, he called me the other day and I talked to him that afternoon and, and my goodness, he was so full of anger and, and, and wrath and, and biting nails mad. And then he went home that night and he and his wife had a blow up. But you know, let me tell you something. Now, please don't you for one second think that I'm preaching everybody go home and have a blow up. That's not what I'm talking about. But you know what happens when you do that? Brother Chris, things you're holding in, they come out. And you know what was amazing, Jimmy Dell, the next day? You know what was amazing? Almost every problem had been fixed. You know why there was a problem? It's because nobody's being real. Where do you know me from? Oh, I know you, man. I saw you got that, got that tie on, got that suit on, got that dress, got your pocketbook wrapped across your arm, and, and you know you got the world by the tail on a downhill pool. That ain't where the Lord knows you from. That ain't where the Lord knows you from. He knows you from your nastiness. He knows you from your mess. He knows you with the smell of sin on you. He knows you with the ashes and the dust from the quagmire that you're going through. I don't know what happened under the fig tree. But I know that Jesus wasn't speaking about the Nathaniel coming down the road. He was speaking to the one that was under the tree. You're probably pretty lucky the Lord hadn't answered my prayer. Because I prayed, Lord, let me speak into somebody's life with that same authority. Maybe it's while you were waiting in line at the drive through at Taco Bell and there's four cars in front of you. You just shut your eyes and tears begin to pour down your face. You realize it ain't taco that I'm wanting. But boy, there's an emptiness inside of me. Maybe it was in the morning when you drive to work and you're trying to corral all your stuff in the car while you're driving down the road, trying to make sure you hit the clock on time. And the feeling comes into your mind, just pass on by the driveway. The thought of going in there makes me sick at my stomach. I gotta go there, and I gotta, uh, I gotta pretend I love it, and I gotta pretend I love this, and, and I just want to stay right here. 
I want to stay right here. And it's right there. It's right there. When you drive home after being made fun of by your relatives because you don't do the things you once used to do, there's a knot swelled up in your throat and you wonder if it's even worth it. But I can't let my husband know that. I can't let my wife know that. I, I got I to gotta keep this up. It was right then that the Lord said, let me deal with that. Let me deal with that. But we've become so accustomed to hiding behind our screens. You say, I don't know if I believe that or not. I, I believe it. Let me tell you, let me prove it to you. Because back in the day, when conviction got a hold of your heart so bad it felt like that your, that your heart was going to be squeezed in two, you stood up, you got out in the aisle, and you made your way to an altar. Because another word for the altar is a fig tree. Because it's right down here. It's in His presence. How useless, how futile is it to try to be something you're not in the presence of the Lord? The one that made you. The one that knows so much about you. Remember what He told Jeremiah? Jeremiah said, I can't go talk to them people. I'm but a child. I'm nobody. I'm young. I'm no good for nothing. The Lord said, let me tell you something, boy. I knew you before you was ever in your mama. And I sanctified you while you were in your mama. I have called you. And I have put a word in your mouth. Think about it just for a minute. The Pharisee and the publican are standing at the altar. And the publican begins to talk about all he's done. And then he has the audacity. I don't know about you all, but it, it really makes me mad when I read this story. Because I got something for that Pharisee. Because he stands right next to that man and says, Thank God I'm not like that publican. You want to know why they hated Jesus? Because he got behind the mask. He said, I, I know what you want everybody to think you are. But you know what the publican said? I'm no good. God have mercy on me. I am who I am. And the Bible lets us know he was godless. How, just for a minute, put yourself in the Pharisee's shoes and let it go. Instead of saying, I thank God, I thank God I'm not like the publican. Pray, God make me like the publican. Because that's who I really am. I'm really not worthy to even stand in your presence. I've been a liar. I've been a thief. I've been a cheat. I've stole from people I loved. I have cursed. I have cursed your name, Lord. I have used it in vain. I have been nothing. And I've done everything I was taught not to do. I've done everything the Bible says not to do. I disrespected my parents. I disrespected my teachers. I won't hold down a job. It's just me. The world gives us so many ready-made excuses and the truth of the matter is God ain't worried about them. He died for you at your lowest. So here I am with all I have. I raise my hands to worship you. We're going to play some music in a few minutes because that's the way things are supposed to go. But you know when it was Nathaniel and the fig tree, that's all it was. And the only music, the only music was the flow of the breeze through the fig leaves. <laughs>